It is 10 o'clock. The bell has been rung. It's been uh, phenomenal last week, and as we kick off this week, we're here to start it the right way. We've gathered in this place to worship, and so if you would please open your ears this morning to hear the word of the Lord proclaimed in Psalm 33 as he welcomes us to worship this morning. There's a recurring theme that we'll touch on this day. Verse 18 of Psalm 33 says this, But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to to deliver them from death, to keep them alive in famine. We await in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. This is God's word to his people this morning and a wonderful reminder that we have come here this morning to worship the God in whom we have placed all of our hope and all of our trust. So let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Gracious Father, Lord, as the one who created all that there is, the one who breathed life into us after creating us in his own image. The one who loved us so much that he would send his only begotten son so that his death would be a satisfaction, a propitiation for our sins so that we could be reconciled to you, Father. You whose love knows no bounds. You whose power has no end. We put our trust and our hope in you. And so, Father, this morning as we gather in this place to worship you, We just ask that your Holy Spirit would be alive in our hearts and in our minds, helping us to focus solely on you, casting aside the things of this world and focusing on you, elevating you to that throne that is yours and yours alone, acknowledging that we are your people and that we seek to do your will. For we love you, Lord, and we thank you and we praise you in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. We've opened up with a word from the Lord. We've given a word to the Lord. And now a joyful noise. Where are we going, Kathy? We're going to open with number 404, the solid rock. Please stand when you have it.
to take your seats for a moment. So glad that you could join us here to worship with us this morning, this Sunday after Thanksgiving, which also happens to be the first Sunday in the Advent season. It's been quite a week on the island. And I just, I want to say to all who helped make the events of this past week happen, going back to the community Thanksgiving from last Sunday through to a very successful holiday market yesterday, um, what a week to be on the Fusky. It was a blessed time, and just thank you all for pouring out of yourselves to help make that happen. I know people who have stumbled upon Defusky for the first time this past week cannot believe what we have here. It's a special place, and so thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I um, want to remind you of a couple of simple points for our worship service. First and foremost, if you have one of these in your pocket, if you would please at least make sure that it is on silent. Secondly, there is coffee, our coffee ministry in full swing back there on the table by the stairs. And it is always appropriate when we praise our coffee ministry to then tell you that the bathrooms are through this door. So um, this upcoming Tuesday. If you are looking for ways to work off the feasting that you've done in the last week, there is going to be a work crew that's going out to the various graveyards here on the island. I know Yvonne's going to be working in the Hague Point Cemetery. Do you have any idea what time you're going to be up there? I'm hoping uh, around 9, 9.30 at the latest. Okay. Um, for those of you who are in Hague Point and don't know where the Hague Point Cemetery is, this is a great opportunity to find out. I know Sally's going to have some folks working in the cemeteries out in the, in the back part of the island as well. So um, a good opportunity to learn a little history, get a little exercise, get a little fellowship in. So something to think about on Tuesday. All right, so Kathy is not going to tell you anything more about that. She's just going to tease you with that little factoid. So if you want to find out more about that, you know where you have to be on Tuesday. Just bring a sling blade. That's right. Don't tell them what it is until Tuesday. All right. Keep them hanging. All right. Um, also, next Sunday after church and the following Sunday after church is a special Bible study opportunity. Um, some of you ladies have been involved with the Bible study that Ann Flynn has been leading throughout the last couple of years. You know she is a phenomenal teacher. Men, if you've never had an opportunity to sit in on any of her teaching, you should. It's really good. And so next Sunday and the following Sunday, the 4th and the 11th, there will be a lunch and a learn following our worship service here. Um, and I think Ann has got some materials back there next to the coffee table. I'm next to the coffee um, because she loves it when people come prepared to her uh, sessions. So there are some questions back there, and you can get yourself prepared in advance. She loves it even more when people show up. So if you haven't gotten a chance to go through the questions beforehand and all of a sudden it is next Sunday, just come anyway. Come for the fellowship. Come for the learning. It'll be a good time. Any other announcements that we need to be making our congregation aware of? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to our next phase of our worship service, fellowship. We are almost at the point where somebody, after spending just a couple of minutes in fellowship, could come close to telling me the names of everybody in this room. Consider that a challenge. Get up out of your seats. Get to know the unfamiliar faces. Think about who we might call on.
So, anybody want to go ahead and point out the names of everybody here? <laughs> Listen, we, we joke, but when we started attending this church 17 years ago, um, that was not a difficult thing to do, to look around and name everybody that was here. These ladies right up here in the front can attest to that. I mean, it was, it was an easy thing to do, and so it's a lovely problem to have. But I do hope that you at least now know the name of one person that you didn't know before you came on in here to worship this morning. I, I can't reiterate enough the importance of fellowshipping with other believers and strengthening the bonds that unite us. Um, life is pretty good for us. But scripture tells us that there will be challenges, that there will be difficulties. And it's not hard to look out into society today to see places in the world where persecution and oppression are very, very real. And to anticipate a time, maybe not in the too distant future here in this country, where there will be greater levels of persecution and, op and oppression for those who hold to the Bible. So we can never go wrong with strengthening our fellowship with other believers. If for no other reason, even in the regular cause of difficulties, when we can put our arms around each other and lift each other up in the name of the Lord is always a good thing. So thank you for taking that time of fellowship seriously as an act of worship. But I know that Kathy has taken note because that's what she does. And I know as well that Jennifer has also taken note that whilst you were fellowshipping, you were further warming up your voices right. <laughs> for that which comes next. So what comes next? Jennifer's going to be introducing us to a new hymn. You all have your lyrics. Does everybody have their lyrics? If you don't have your lyrics, Sharon Habbard back there is saying, I don't know what I'm singing. Yep, over there. OK. Sharon, do you need one? Here you go. You can have mine. I sing very well, but I have to follow along.
please go ahead and take your seats again. I gotta say, you have a lovely voice, and I felt stronger with you next to me. <laughs> Don't no. say anything. <laughs> what she said. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> All right. Well, as we continue along in our worship service, it's uh, our time for prayer requests and praise reports and testimonies. Um, just as we spent some time making sure that we were having fellowship with each other, getting to know one another, um, the practical application of getting to know each other is to love each other better through prayer, through praise through testimony, through walking through life with each other. And so this is an invitation to you to share with the rest of our family how we can be living life together. Prayer requests, praise reports, and testimonies. I see a hand in the back. Sharon, you, lit, you win. <laughs> Thank you. Up, oh, yes, Pam. Um, God will mercy for my family that lost a baby in the back of the mountains and my other nephew that was just back in childhood. And God will mercy for Captain Eagle. Yeah, a couple of. <laughs> a few, we got a lot of folks traveling today. I do not envy those who will be traveling today. No. Anne. So, just for clarification, the wedding isn't her own. It is not. Okay. They've been married 53 years. Aww. No, this is her granddaughter's getting married. And I will be traveling to that, but that's not for a couple of few weeks. Others? Jordan. Okay, other prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. Yes, Jen. I've got a list. Okay, okay, bring it on. <laughs> so my, my praise report is that my son and his family were able to come to some Thanksgiving with us. Mm -hmm. And a child of mine just drove to go in, and as well as a client of his, a huge church in the Atlanta area. Oh, wow. He's got a lot of church trouble. He has some big faith. Um, my other praise is that my mom's birthday is this week. Um, we finished it. We'll be praying up your mom. Okay, other prayer requests, praise reports, testimony. Yeah. My parents' anniversary was Friday. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> How many years? 22. 22. <laughs> Definitely worthy of praise. Other prayer requests, praise reports, testimonies. How are we doing? Jennifer. Shout out to the <coughs> to the Fuskians. I just thought it was just lovely. So we just want to pray blessings over those people. Amen and amen to that. Anyone else? This is your time. Yvonne? Yeah. Let's thank you for being here today. And praise for all the people that are here today. Thank you. This was beautiful. <laughs> all the faces, smiling. Um, By the way, a couple of those smiling. I just want you all to know. 
That, those, she was their lunch lady. We'll edit this part out. <laughs> to skip Thanksgiving. In that case, I will lead us in our time of corporate prayer this morning. I invite you to be praying along with me. But as always, I also would ask that when the Holy Spirit decides to call one of these prayer requests to your attention, would you make note of it? Put it in your phone, write it down, whatever you need to do, so that during the course of this upcoming week, whenever you are having your quiet time with the Lord, you would then lift that prayer request up as well. Putting your arm, therefore, around one of your brothers and sisters in Christ that's here worshiping with you this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, please don't let us skip through this moment taking it for granted. Let us instead recognize what a wonderful thing it is to know that the God that created the universe and created each one of us wants to hear from us wants to know what's going on in our hearts, even though you can read our minds. You, can, you invite us to come before you as your people. Thank you for that. 
And we come to you this morning as your church. And Lord, we want to lift up to you the family of Dick Roberts. For Kevin and all of his brothers and family as they mourn the passing of their father. Not terribly long after losing their mother. Lord, we just we pray that you would comfort them. Bring them that peace that passes all understanding <clears throat> and knowledge of you. Lord, we ask for travel mercies. There are many in this room who will be traveling. There are those who came to visit people in this room who are traveling. And there are millions more that will be out and about this Sunday. And we just ask that, that you would make straight their paths, that you would go with them and protect them and, and help everybody to return home safely after a time spent with family and friends. Lord, we want to lift up to you and Sister Carolyn. She's got a busy season ahead with a couple of eye surgeries and a shoulder surgery and a, a wedding to attend. And we just we pray, Lord, that, that those procedures would go well, go smoothly, that there would be a swift healing and a wonderful celebration. We want to lift up to you Jordan's friend Emma and her family. And Lord, they are going through some difficulties that we would wish upon no one and we just we pray that that they would find comfort and solace in your arms that you would grant them wisdom to make wise choices and help them to get through this time father lord we want to lift up to you uh, kathy's son and we're grateful that he was able to visit and pray that you would be with him amongst all others that are traveling be with her mom for her birthday celebration for 85 years it's not a fun way to celebrate a birthday with a procedure coming up, but we pray that that would go well, and we pray also that you would be a source of comfort as she mourns the sudden passing of one of her dearest friends. Lord, we do want to give you thanks again. 22 years of marriage is something to be celebrated in this society, and so we are grateful that Jen and Ed are here worshiping with us this morning and celebrating their life together. We want to lift up to you praises for the committee that put together such a wonderful holiday market celebration. We thank you for their work. We thank you for a wonderful day of weather and for just a wonderful event, Father. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for Yvonne. We thank you for looking out for her, whether it be lost glasses or a lost cell phone, letting her know that you take interest in that which is lost. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for a tangible expression of that. Lord, we want to also lift up to you Ernestine and her granddaughter. The time of a birth is impending, and we just pray that that goes well. That would be a joyful time. We thank you for healing Andy, for getting him better and stronger. We're sorry he missed out on the feast, but we pray that you would restore to him his health so that he can join them for future events. And Lord, we want to praise you for the healing that you have continued to do in our friend Jeff, bringing him back from such a devastating injury. And Lord, you have given him an ability to let people know that they can survive head injuries. And so we want to lift up to you, Laura. And as she is facing her own recovery from a head injury, we just we lift her up to you as well. And we pray that you would speed her healing and bring about a full recovery. Lord, there are other prayer requests in the hearts and minds of your people gathered here today. But your Holy Spirit has already heard them, already found them in the depths of our soul and brought them before you. And so we trust that you will do whatever is best and right for us. And we thank you and we praise you. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue on in our worship time, it is a time for our reading for today. I have asked Anne to come on up and read for us from Isaiah chapter 9. The reading is from <clears throat> Isaiah 9, uh, verses 1 through 7. 9, 1 through 7. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. 
but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The word of the Lord. Advent season is upon us. Okay, well, we've reached that time now for our offering. And Ed, can I call upon you and Jeff to pass the plates around today? <clears throat> Just a casual reminder that our offering, we are grateful for it. It's how we keep the lights on and further the ministry efforts here in the church. And so if you have the ability to give today and the joy in your heart to do so, please give. God loves a cheerful giver. I'm not so sure how he feels about a reluctant and hesitant giver. So let's not test those waters. Just hold on to that if that's the case this morning. But as always, know that, that you have been blessed with so many more gifts than you can possibly pull out of your wallet this morning. We've got some ladies this morning who want to share a gift with us for our offering time. And as you experience that and feel the richness of it, just know that that you have a gift that will have a similar impact on people for God's kingdom if you will but let it go and share it. And I don't know what that gift is, but please find out and please use it liberally. Ladies, what you got for us this morning? <clears throat> Okay, and this. Uh, <laughs> and as we prepare for today's message, I invite you one more time to please just bow your head in, in prayer with me this morning, Father, Lord, if you would just.
take me now and get me out of your way. Empty me of myself and make me a useful vessel through whom your word can be proclaimed. And Lord, if you would send your Holy Spirit to be working in and through our minds so that we would hear these words and receive them as you intend them to be heard and be working in our hearts, Father, as well, setting our hearts on fire with a love for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are certain words in the English language that seem to have this inherent power of their own. And is not one of them. Hope, however, is. When you hear the word hope, you can sense it. You can feel it. Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, making sure they get credit where credit is due, tell us that as a noun, hope means a desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. And as a verb, it is to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true. It is optimistic. It is powerful. Perhaps it is most powerful when you see the impact on someone who has no hope compared to someone who has hope. Hope also happens to be the general theme when you kick off Advent, <clears throat> depending upon which of the churches you are celebrating Advent in. And so for that reason, you have heard hope time and again and again in our service today. And our sermon today will focus on hope. To get there, I took you to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. And as we try to get our arms around the message that Isaiah was bringing, it's important to understand a little bit more about who Isaiah was and what was going on when he gave those words, that prophetic message of ours. Now, Isaiah ministered in a time between probably 740 B.C. and 700 BC, roughly 40 years of ministry. He started out under King Uzziah, and then uh, the last king that he served was King Hezekiah. He delivered prophetic messages, and I think, frankly, the one that comes to my mind the most when I think about Isaiah is chapter 53, where we hear about the suffering servant, one who was going to be bruised crushed, pierced for our iniquities. Prophetic verses so fulfilled with the life of Christ. I don't think that Isaiah understood at the time that he was uttering those prophetic verses about the suffering of a servant that he would recognize that he too would suffer because under King Manasseh he was sawed in two. Not exactly the ending that you hope to have if you are faithful to God. But our verses for today speak to another prophetic statement that Isaiah uttered, not about the life and death of Jesus, the Messiah, but about the birth of the one who would come to save us. That's why we celebrate it in the run up to Christmas. And that's why we're going to focus on it today. When these verses were uttered, it was a time of turmoil in Judah and in Israel, the northern, and northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Isaiah served in the southern kingdom in Jerusalem. During that time, they had both northern and southern reestablished their historic borders as had been given to them by God when they came into, into the promised land, the promised people, the chosen people in the promised land. But as this message is preached, turmoil has come. The northern territories have been invaded. Assyria is a rising power seeking to conquer. The northern kingdom of Israel has ganged up with Syria trying to fight off the Assyrian invasion. They go down to the southern kingdom and say, Judah, wouldn't you like to join us in our battle? Judah says, no, thank you, which was the wrong answer. 
at least according to the northern kingdom, because then Israel and Syria start a war with Judah. Their thought being, if we can simply overthrow their king, we can install our own king who will then say, yeah, we'll fight with you. And they can then take the resources and turn and fight against the Assyrians. So they had actually three options down in the southern kingdom. They could have gone along with Syria and Israel. They could have fought against Israel. They could have prayed to God and asked for deliverance. And they actually said, we'll take door number four, which you didn't give to us. We're going to reach out to the Assyrians and see if they'll partner with us. Well, when you're looking at a conquering force, an invading force coming out of the north, there are a couple of things that you don't want to do. The first thing you don't want to do is deplete your inner defenses by fighting against your brothers and sisters. That doesn't work well. To spend all of your people, all of your money, all of your resources <coughs> fighting not the ultimate enemy is not productive. You also don't want to turn your back on God. Well, it didn't work out well. And so the forces are coming on in. It is a time of darkness. It is a time of concern. It's a time I think we don't really have the ability to understand, frankly, because this is a time of national hopelessness. In our day and age, living in this country, we can get our arms around personal hopelessness, a terminal cancer diagnosis, a loved one suffering with an addiction so powerful that they've lost their job, they've lost their home, and they're losing their health all for the sake of one more hit. We can get our arms around that. We can get our arms around the hopelessness that a teenager feels in the most vulnerable of times when they're being bullied, and they can't see it ever ending. These are things on an individual case that we can get our arms around a sense of hopelessness. But national hopelessness is something we don't understand. I mean, the last time that we were invaded as a nation was 1812. Yes, we had this Civil War thing that was pretty devastating for a period of time, but that was 160 years ago. We've had attacks on American soil with Pearl Harbor, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, but the reality is, we don't know what it is like to be a people under siege. The closest we can come is trying to see what's going on in Ukraine. To understand what it's like to have a massive invading force come on in, fire at will, cut off your electricity, your food supplies, and try to just starve you into death. That was the hopelessness that was facing Israel and facing Judah at this time. The knowledge that this massive force was coming on down was going to engage in siege works so that they couldn't deal with individual hopelessness because they were too worried about starving to death themselves. This is a darkness that we don't understand. But they were all too aware of it. And it's into this time that Isaiah speaks. Now, you would hope, being people of God, looking for hope, that Isaiah's words to them are, people, if you will but turn your hearts back to God and repent, he will forestall this invading army. He'll turn them back. He will use his awesome power and might, slay them in their tracks, and, and you will be my people and I will be your God. They were hoping for that message. And frankly, there were priests and prophets who were proclaiming that message to them. Not unlike our prosperity preachers of today. You know, health and wealth and prosperity, if you will, but give more to the church kind of a thing. People who are too focused on telling you all the good things about God without actually telling you that you need to obey him. Well, the people in Israel, the chosen people, the hand-picked people by God, put in the promised land, had turned their backs on God. 
they had become as if they were one of any other number of nations around them, worshiping secular idols instead of the one true God, all the while laying claim to the title of the chosen people in the promised land. Yeah, we're God's people. I got no clue who God is, but we're his people. And for that reason, instead of hearing words encouraging them to repent and turn back, they heard from Isaiah words of judgment and condemnation and a difficult trial to come. That's not what you want to hear when you are looking for hope. King Saul, first king of Israel, appointed by God because the people wanted a king. Towards the end of Saul's life, the Philistines are threatening the people. There's a war coming, and it's not looking good for the Israelites. And Saul is freaking out, and he is seeking guidance. Well, he turns his attention to the witch of Endor and asks her to summon Samuel, the dead prophet. Raise him up from the grave so that I can get counsel on what I should do. Didn't work out well for Saul. Because when you reach down into the grave looking to the dead for advice, the advice you get is usually going to lead you right down to them in the grave. And that's what happened to Samuel. That was Samuel's words to Saul. And that's how things turned out for Saul. The people at the same time, as they were hearing these words of judgment from Isaiah, were looking to the necromancers, to the mediums for guidance. They were looking down into the depths of darkness for a ray of light. And that's not the right place to look. So Isaiah then says, in the midst of what you are doing, in the midst of all this judgment that is to come, stop looking down in the dirt for your salvation. You're not going to find it there. And yes, there is going to be judgment. And yes, it's going to be really bad for almost all of you. But I'm God. And you are my people. And I have a plan that's going to come to fruition through your line. And so he says to them those wonderful words from our verse that were read by Anne today. He tells them that one is coming. He tells them that for unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. If we're to understand this, we can't just say, what does that mean to me? We've got to understand, what does it mean to Isaiah? Because Isaiah wrote it to a people who were wondering what was going on. And so we need to try to get our arms around what he was saying. And what he was saying is, this is really bad. We've got Assyrians coming down to us. I'm a prophet. Holy Spirit's been speaking to me. There might, he might even know that the Babylonians are coming. But ultimately what he is saying is God has promised something through you. Things are going to get better sometime down the road. I don't know that he was thinking 700 years down the road. But he knew things were going to get better. He was staring in the face of a really difficult time. And he says, don't worry. The gloom is going to pass. You folks up there in Galilee, the first ones to suffer from the invasion, I got good news. There's going to be glory coming your way. I don't, think it's in, I don't think it is incidental that Jesus' earthly ministry was based up in Galilee, foretold this way, a place where God's glory can shine and one of the first places lost in the invasion of Syria. But the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. Hopelessness is deep and utter darkness, isn't it? 
know, that phrase, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that's so important because there are times when you're in that tunnel where you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, yes. And Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And so Isaiah here is saying that light is shining down from darkness, shining down. His light for all of us. But then he says these words. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing their plunder. These are people who have seen their wealth disappear, their food supplies disappear. They know that things are going to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And here Isaiah is saying to them, one is coming. And your joy will be as if you never knew hunger. As if you never knew what it meant to ask for something. Because it's going to be yours, left and right. As if the joy that you would have with that, it is there for you. He says, for in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Our minds work in an interesting and curious way. When we are without hope, and the reason why we are without hope is that there is this massive army steamrolling its way down towards us, we automatically think that if there is to be hope, it is going to involve something delivering us from that army. The phrase, can't see the forest through the trees. Well, some of those trees are pretty big. And when they fall on you, you don't really care what's going on in the rest of the forest. These people were concerned with this invading army. They couldn't see the big picture, what God had in store. They thought that which was afflicting them, that which was keeping them from being the people who God wanted them to be, was an opposing force, an army. They didn't realize that we have no reason to fear that which can kill the body. But we should instead fear that which can kill the body and the soul in hell. God's saying, if it's temporary, don't fear it. And an oppressing army is temporary. Keep your eyes on me. So he sends one who will relieve us of the oppression, but not of an army but of our sin. We see it clearly now, but they didn't see it then. And I understand that. I've heard it said that if you want somebody to hear the gospel, feed them some food first. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for a fire. Because when there is peace, there's no more need for the garment of war. The one who is to come will bring that. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. It's a strange thought that the one that would save us. Has to start as a child. Has to start as an infant. But that was the plan. That this won't be any regular kid. This won't be any normal baby born. Because when you see what he's going to be called, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Mm -hmm. Understand this. For as much as the people of Israel, as much as the chosen people had turned their backs on God, they knew this one thing. That the first commandment was thou shalt have no other gods before me. They didn't adhere to it, but they knew that. Just as we all do. And what that means is if you are a prophet of God, you don't tell people that there's another God coming. But if there's a child to be born who's going to be called God, it's going to be God. Isaiah tells us that this child to be born is divine. It is God himself. He's going to be the everlasting father. He's going to be eternal. 
and his peace will reign forever. If you are facing hopelessness and you are Israel or you are Judah, the thought of peace, the thought of a deliverer, is the fulfillment of a promise you heard from Moses. When Moses, conveying God's word, says that I will raise up another prophet from amongst you like me. The expectation that there will be one who can deliver them. And again, they're reflecting back, Moses delivered them from Egypt, from their enslavement there. And they're thinking again, personal deliverance from our oppressing army. They missed the point. But the point is one that we haven't missed because we know it. Because now we stand here 2,700 years later knowing that that deliverer came for us too. That this promise from Isaiah, this hope laid forth was meant to be a hope that we could hold on to as well. Because oppressing armies come and go. Famines come and go. Enslavement happens. But sin is always with us. And God wants us with him. He wants us focusing on that which is eternal. And so I just want to hit you up real quickly with these verses that reiterate that point. Ephesians 1.18 I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Colossians 1.27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of his glory. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Romans 8.24, for in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Romans 5.5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Psalm 135 says this, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. In his words, I put my hope. One last one. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The one that we are called to put our hope into is the one who was foretold by Isaiah in our verses for this day. For unto us a child is born, To us a son has been given. He is a mighty God. Wonderful counselor. Everlasting father and prince of peace. There is no other place to put your hope. This hope will never disappoint you. So don't worry about the oppressing forces around you. Don't worry about those challenging, difficult times that cause you to have moments of personal hopelessness. My friends, our hope is based on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's hold on to that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, there is always hopelessness in this world because sin prevails and sin pervades. But your glory endures forever. Your son has conquered sin and death. And invited us to accept the washing of his blood that wipes away our sin. So that we too can be presented holy and blameless before you. Father, let us affix our hopes on him. On that cross. And let us live lives of fearlessness. Because you have already won the victory for us. We love you, Father. We cannot thank you enough for what you have done. But we will try by giving you our lives. And serving you with glory. With honor. And with great joy. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you.
In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, we have reached the time for our communion. The Lord's Supper. If you are a student of your Bible and you flip throughout the scripture and you see what it has to say about when to do the Lord's Supper together, you will find this. It doesn't tell you. What it does say is whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so I know that in Catholic churches, they do it every Mass. Here we do it on the fourth Sunday of the month. <clears throat> and all it is is an opportunity to express outwardly the inward transformation that has taken place because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. All who have a relationship with the Lord are welcome at this table. And I don't care what denomination you're with. If you feel like you have a relationship with the Lord and you want to come and partake of this, come on up. We'd love to have you join with us. If you don't know where you stand with the Lord, but you don't want to be left out, come on up and let me pray for you. I don't want you to feel left out. I want you to know that you have hope in Jesus. <clears throat> if you have a green hymnal, and I know most of you do, if you would please find 647, which is the responsive reading in the back of the green hymnal. <clears throat> you guys knew it was coming. When you have found 647, I invite you to stand so that we can read together responsibly the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> I will read the lighter colored print, and I invite you to read in response the bold colored print. There's the possibility that your neighbor has a slightly different version than you do. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to exercise grace and not look at them funny, because you might be the one with the wrong version. Anyway, we're just going to go through it. We'll get to the end at the same time. Let us read together 647, the Lord's Supper. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Amen. So I'm going to ask for us to come to the Lord's table, single file manner, starting from this side over. And I'll ask if you just come. If you would, please remind me of your name. I know pretty much everybody's name, but I'm really bad at recall at times, as my wife can attest. So if you would just show me a little grace and mercy myself and... Remind me of your name as you approach the table. That way we can personalize it. Take your element back to your seat. And then when everybody has these elements, we can commune together.
Having now all received our elements, if you would be willing to flip over the short end and take and peel it back and reveal the wafer. Let us commune together Christ's body broken for us. And if you will flip it one more time. Let us commune together Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And after they had communed together, they went out to the Mount of Olives singing what they didn't realize was going to be their closing hymn for the day. <laughs> Let's all sing Amazing Grace, first and last verse, number 202. <clears throat> benediction may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of his holy spirit rest abide and remain in each and every one of you and in so doing may he grant you that amazing capacity to go forth from here to truly love your neighbor as yourself and the church all said Amen. you have entered to worship depart to serve and may you all have a blessed week Amen.